the stand here to this podium here this morning, which is real fun for me. And I think we've got every yeah. Is it tall enough? It's not tall enough. <laughs> just, I feel like a giant. It's really great for me. Um, let us, uh, let's pray before we get into it, and then we'll, uh, we'll get started. So, let us pray. Almighty God, thank you that you love us. Thank you that you are here with us. Thank you that you've given us time to look into your word and to try and understand more about what happened on the cross. God, give us insight, give us patience, and a mind on which you in and through your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, uh, this morning, so I, what I had been sort of uh, advertising was this was the week we were going to do the really fun Let's talk about penal substitutionary atonement, right? That was what was, that's what we were gonna do, and I was gonna do my darndest to give a great uh, sell on that one. I don't know if you know this, that's harder than it seems. And so, what we're gonna do uh, instead this week, because I do wanna do the best I can, and I wasn't going to be able to do that. Um, we are actually, and something I think is gonna be a little more helpful for us, uh, we are going to, one, review the three main paradigms because it's going to be great if we have our understanding of classic, objective, and subjective paradigms down uh, before we move on. And we're actually going to go through some of the big verses that we see in the Bible, mostly in the New Testament, because we're talking about what happened on the cross, right? Mostly in the New Testament to kind of see if we can understand how the Bible lends itself to more than just one singular uh, atonement theory, right? So just to kind of get it in our understandings that some of them are actually going to lend to all three. Some of them are going to be just general atonement. Some of them are going to be very specific to the one, but that's part of the thing we talked about with systematic theology last week, right? One of the shortcomings of systematic theology is that in order to build something that is systematically built on itself or systematically build anything out, it has to try to include as much as it can, but it can't do everything. And so when we're looking at the Bible, specifically the New Testament, specifically at the atonement, we have to have an understanding that these are gonna work for different things and that one atonement theory is not gonna cover a biblical atonement. Does that make sense? So that is what we're gonna do. Then we're gonna talk other concerns um, and then we are going to talk about upcoming classes. So, a systematic theology of atonement. We did this last week, but just as a refresher, there are three main paradigms of systematic theology of atonement. So, what are the big three sort of categories that we think in classic, objective, and subjective? Classic, remember, is Satan word in its focus. So, you can replace the word Satan with the word evil, uh, but the reality is, we're talking about the embodiment of evil, the forces of this world. And this is the idea um, that um, Jesus Christ paid some sort of a ransom with his life to the powers of evil that dwell in the world. That's the classic theory. That somehow, some way, we were under bondage to the powers and the principalities of this world, uh, but that Jesus paid a ransom for that. The objective kind of paradigm is God word in its focus, that the thing that needed to happen was that God needed to be satisfied. This is the kind of God's honor. This is what we're going to see with our penal substitutionary atonement theory. This is satisfaction theory, um, emphasis on penance and the satisfaction due to God from a sinful humanity, a notion inspired by Roman law. Um, so this is what we think of when we think of like fundamentalist, right? This is what, uh, for some of us who grew up in kind of a deeply evangelical place or spent some time there, this is the main atonement theory you're gonna see there. Then we have subjective. Uh, this is human word in its focus. This is the moral exemplar theory. This is where we see that Jesus died, not necessarily as only a sacrifice or a ransom paid, but as a, as a way to show us how to live, that this is how we understand life to be. Um, so from here on out, the main idea here is that the work, the atoning work of Christ is, is designed first and foremost to affect change in human beings. Cain served as a moral exemplar. 
to show us exactly how to live. Um, so that's, we're talking classic, objective, and subjective. Classic is what Alan's gonna teach on. Objective is what I'm teaching on. Subjective, that's all Tony, baby. He's doing it, it's gonna be great. That's next week, right? It is, in fact. Okay, great, as long as you know that. Um, so that is, these are our three. Does this make sense? I know I'm covering quickly, but as long as we're all sort of following. So classic is Satan word, objective, God word, subjective, human word, in the focus of the atonement. Um, I put these in here just as a sort of, like, we talked about these last week, but we also just talked about them right now. Moral transformation, liberation, that's subjective. Um, so then we're gonna, we're gonna go now into um, scriptural concerns. Um, and so there's kind of three things that I was noticing when I was putting this together. There are systematic building blocks. So there are some where they are gonna talk a lot about like Satan is the ruler of the world, but they're not gonna talk about Jesus paying a ransom to Satan. So this is part of that systematic building block, right? So an understanding that says that Jesus paid a ransom unto the powers of the world, unto the powers of evil, the power of Satan, has to prove that there is a power of Satan in the world, right? And so that's part of the systematic building block. And so we'll see some of that in the scriptures. So not, not dealing directly with the atonement like some will, but all are systematic building blocks for this theory, right? And then so we'll see some where the atonement is directly dealt with, where we're told exactly how Jesus died, why Jesus died, um, and what happened on that cross. And then we'll see just kind of general atonement, that there was an atonement made. So these are the categories that I have here kind of written out. So what we're going to do is I'm going to put up 15 verses. We're going to go through them one by one. And I want us as a group to kind of start putting these in the boxes that they belong or where they kind of already are by the culture. So we're going to see some that are just very general atonement. Great. We'll put them under general atonement. We'll see some that seem to lend themselves to a classic understanding, same word in its focus. There are some that seem to talk about objective or God word in its focus and some that deal with moral transformation of humans. Now, one of the things that we'll see is that lots of them go in lots of places which is the point, right? The point that I'm kind of trying to make with this whole thing, that the Bible itself does not fit cleanly into these categories. They're, these are just helpful for us. But to understand a biblical idea of the atonement, we have to understand that each of these is actually right. It's not, it's not saying like, here is the very two-dimensional, here's what it is, dropped out of the sky. It's more like a gem that has 70 different faces. Right now we're looking at three of them three different faces that were turning, it's still the same thing, but it's shining the light a little differently every time. It looks a little different. It's cut a little different, but it's still the same thing. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Excellent. So let's start. We have uh, Isaiah 53, 5. April, can you read Isaiah 53, 5 for me? But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. Okay. Where would that go? Objective. So objective, that's God word in its focus. Um, let's see, so punishment that made us whole by his bruises, we are healed. Does anyone see? So it might go under objective. Yeah, we'll put Isaiah there. It's like penance. Yeah, punishment made Penish, us whole. So punishment, right? Punishment that made us whole, absolutely. Um, anyone else see where it might be? This is a classic verse that's used for um, the like ransom. subject. It's actually used for all three. This is oh, the, the yeah. Oh, yeah. See, yeah, it's so C, tricky. C, 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 C. So it's general because the general it goes under. So we have it under general. I think we have it under classic as well. And subjective typically uses this because it was the punishment that made us whole. Yeah. It changed us. Oh, yeah. It made us whole people. So this is classic for all three, and that's worth noting, um, that everything that you will read uh, in, <laughs> in atonement stuff is going to use this to prove its own point, because this is where we kind of get the idea of the suffering servant, right? That's the reason I put it first. Um, so, 2 Corinthians, who wants to read that? 
to start typing. Yes, Claire, go ahead. God made him <clears throat> who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What do we see? Subjective. We see, what do you say? Subjective. Subjective? You got it. Anywhere else it could be? Objective. Okay. I think you're right. Yeah. This is God made him, right? Right? This is the work of God. And yet, that we might become the righteousness, right? So objective and subjective, absolutely correct. That's 100% where these are. Um, somebody read, Mary Beth, would you mind reading Romans 3? Since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, they are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. This one is almost used exclusively for one. The other ones really don't touch it. Which one do we think? Objective. That's the right, that's the right. Yeah, you guys got it. No, this is... Uh, <laughs> This one is so, uh, this one is very, 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 like we see God put forward as a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. So God did this. By his blood effective through faith, he did this to show his righteousness. So that he had passed over sins previously committed. That he had somehow let something go that he couldn't let go. So this is somehow, some way, very, very Godward in its focus. Um, there's a, uh, there's a whole question that ends up here, which is, did Christ die for us or for God? This says Christ died for God, right? And so this is very, very objective in its, uh, in its focus. Classic, classic text. And if you, are, uh, if you spent any time in evangelical churches, 100% you have heard this verse before, because this is where, this is the Romans road, this is... All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That is just so well known. The rest of this absolutely says, because of that sin, atonement had to be made because God had formerly passed over those sins. And so this is objective. Luke 13, who's got it? Who wants to read it? Go for it. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the, on the Sabbath, and just then there appeared a woman She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid the hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, There are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days to be cured and not on the Sabbath. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrite, does not each one, each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or donkey from the manger and lead it to water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for eighteen long years, be set free from his bondage on the Sabbath day? So we're not necessarily, thank you, one, two, amazing that you could see that, great <laughs> eyes, really very impressed. <laughs> Uh, and three, we're not really talking about atonement, right? We see a healing, and so there's something there. But more in a building of a systematic, which one does this fall under? Subjective. Subjective. How so? Liberation. Liberation. Okay, so we see that for sure. Luke 13. Changed human beings. Changed human beings, so a healing, right? It's all human. It's all human. Let's look at the last verse. And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years? This is 100% something that is used in the classic. Every, every time that you see a ransom theory or a Christus Victor, you're going to find Luke 13. You're going to find, the, at the very least, the end of Luke 13 um, as a part of it. Because this shows that somehow in the thinking of the time, 
in the thinking of Jesus himself, Satan was binding people. Satan somehow had the power to bind people for 18 long years and to be set free from bondage. So classic is going to deal a ton. Anytime you see something about the ruler, Satan is the ruler of the world, or Ephesians 2, there's a whole thing about um, you were children of wrath under the power of the prince of the power of the air and the principalities that are now at work and the sons of disobedience. When we're talking about this sort of like spiritual warfare kind of stuff, that's almost always classic. That can absolutely get you subjective, and you guys saw it clearly, which is awesome. But that is mostly classic. Yes. Yeah, I was, was going to say like so the whole the whole time we're hearing humans questioning, humans yeah. helping, human, yeah. human, 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 and at the last second we drop in Satan. So that changes everything. It changes yeah. everything. Okay. Yeah, and it's not these two have a lot to do with each other, and there's a ton of conversation between the two. Okay. You'll find a lot of liberation theology will deal a ton with classic, but. In terms of our clean lines that we're trying to draw right now, just as a helpful thing, one, these lines are dotted at best, right? Like, we, there is so much interplay between them, which we already see. But anytime that you see Satan stuff, or powers of the world, or ruler of the world, or whatever, you're going to end up in classic, at least starting there, but will likely end up in subjective kind of stuff. Because if we've been ransomed from something, we're ransomed for something, right? It changes us. So... Great work, everyone. You guys caught the trick I was trying to play. Excellent. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Who's got Romans 5? I can do it. You got it. Uh, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we are still sinners, Christ died for us. So not plural. Um, <laughs> or, 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 or. Christ, wow. You guys... <laughs> I, my whole sermon is about <laughs> how I'm a failure, um, so this is me embodying that. This is an embodied sermon, so, so but while God, but God demonstrates his own love for us, and this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Where do we see it? Classic. Classic? How so? I don't know, it feels not evangelical. It feels evangelical, <laughs> love it. Love it. Yes, Sam. If God demonstrates something. Mmm, it's God demonstrating, so it's God doing something, right? He died, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Yes, so. Simple is a power. Simple. It's objective. It's objective, okay, so I think it is objective. I think you guys are right. Um, Christ this is, died for us is subjective. Yes. This is great. You guys are doing amazing, actually. <laughs> This is also general atonement. This is saying something this happened. Right? This is saying that something happened. And that this is about, oh my gosh, three huzz own yeah. love. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I tried. Like, <laughs> I'm worried. I need to spell check off. Yeah, Canva doesn't really care <laughs> if, I go, if I go to print and just, yeah, bad. Okay. Uh, so I think it is general atonement, mostly because it's saying something happened. There are things that we can read into it. Like, as we're saying, objective, very Godward. Classic, we can say something happened. Subjective, for us, absolutely. To change us. But do we see any change happening here, right? No change. While we were sinners. While we were sinners. So there's something, there's an implied change, but nothing direct. And so you'll see this absolutely everywhere that you're going to look. They're all going to use it. So this is very, very general atonement. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, there was one more. Maybe I'll read this one just in case there are, so you guys don't look at it. <laughs> um, First John 2, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. So if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the world. There's a reason that I put this first part here, right? So what, yes, Sam? Because he's addressing the people, so mm -hmm. that could be subjected to the other part, but it, it is three, three parts of it is uh, saying Christ did this. Uh -huh. Basically, the first part of it is saying, I did this, so you don't have to suffer. Uh -huh. uh, the second part of it is he's advocating for you, and uh -huh. the third part is, well, he's the righteous one. Uh -huh. So Yes, the reality is it could probably be all three. It's mostly um, objective and subjective, 
right? Because we have the advocate with the Father, the one who needs advocating, right? Or we need advocating, but the Father needs convincing in this, right? So there is something objective about this, right? Um, Peter 2, 1 through 2. John. John. Is it? <laughs> you guys. Oh, you keep me young. Uh, <laughs> so I think it is objective. This is, and this is the thing, like you're getting one guy's interpretation, right? You could absolutely make an argument that it's any of these, right? I am, I am under the impression that this functions in a very, very objective sense. Um, and so it could be subjective, right? You can, it, there's an implied subjectivity here, but I think mostly it is objective. Does that make sense? Excellent. All right, who's got Mark 2? Who's got it? When Jesus heard this, he, saw, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. What is it? Classic. <clears throat> Classic? Because it's saying not the righteous, but the sinners. Yep. But it's referring to people, so it could be subjective as well. Good read. Anybody else? So it's saying there's an there's implications here, and we're working a ton well, of them. It's kind of Godward too. It's kind of Godward. It's kind of classic, God absolutely. God. Yeah. So you can use this again. I guess I should just say any of these could be used for any. You can make an argument. That's the confusing thing about this. That's the part that I'm the real message I'm trying to get across. This is used a ton in subjective work, saying that a physician who are sick. The implication is that they are going to be made well. There's going to be a change, a shift, not just in their standing, but in the way that they actually live out a lived experience. This one is typically used for um, the kind of uh, subjective, but you're totally right, Sam, in saying that this is also classic um, because the question then becomes, why are they sick? There's a whole binding thing. Anyway, in the, was it 17? Okay, so anyway, uh, 1 Peter 2, 24. Who's got it? You were doing, you do the last one, you got it. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross <clears throat> so that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Mm -hmm. What is it? Yeah? Well, it's Christ, <clears throat> yeah basically paying the ransom so you could say it could be objective but it's also mentioning that your wounds have been healed so like if that's subjective you could argue with that yeah so the question becomes he himself bore our sins in his body so we know that something is being paid right so that having died to sins we might live for righteousness there's something being paid who's it being paid to is that clear no mm, right it's actually a little unclear who is being paid to he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that having died to sins the question becomes who to whom we might live for righteousness by his wounds you have been healed there's implied every bit of it right there's a healing aspect to it so this is you know there's a healing aspect so this becomes subjective there's a payment for sin so that's classic and objective this mostly falls under general atonement that something happens, that by his wounds we have been healed, he bore our sins in his body on the cross, whether those sins are moral, whether those sins are any number of, like, just a, like bad things that we do, whether that's a state, and whoever it was paid to becomes the question that has to be answered. But it's mostly just general atonement stuff. All right, we've got the long act passage. Yes, Miss Claire, go ahead. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel. Preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. How he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. <coughs> For God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he had. He did both in Judea and in Jerusalem. The uh, devil's in there. there. And uh, that was it. I just put dot, dot, dot for no reason. Okay. Um, what is this one? 
the, you paused and cleared your throat at the exact right time um, to, to really punctuate which one this kind of falls into. So you know the message sent to the people of Israel. Yes, 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 yes. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, the Holy Spirit, and he went about doing good to all who were oppressed by a devil. There's actually no atonement in this verse at all, is there? There's no mention of the death. There's no mention of anything paid. But what does it mention? The devil. That's right. It's the devil, folks. And so this, we're working with the building blocks of... Uh, uh, with Satan, yeah. So this is the building blocks of a classic atonement theory. This is saying at some level people are oppressed by the devil, that the devil does have some power. So that's a building block of a classic. This is one of the things you're going to find with the classic um, atonement theory is the reason it's called classic is that almost universally the church fathers were in agreement on this which is a fascinating thing. So people for the first several hundred years who are expositing the Christian story and looking for any atonement kind of stuff, they all landed on a classic. And you can say that was because they had like a very pre-modern thing. You can say whatever you want about it. The reality is they had an understanding that the powers of this world, the powers of evil, did oppress. And there was something that Jesus did that set people free from that oppression, right? And so that's oppressed by the devil. Classic atonement theory. Yes. Got a few more. I'm sorry if this is boring, everyone. <laughs> All right, Heather, can you read Romans 6? Yes. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. It's interesting, right? Yeah. Very confusing. Because the death he died, he died to what? Sin. Which sounds like powers of the world, which sounds like classic. But the life he lives, he lives to. Joy. So that kicked it. Sounds like objective, right? The answer is both. Um, the answer is both of these. Um, and. Um, uh, so death no longer has dominion over him. This is very, very classic and objective. First Peter three eighteen. Who wants it? Yeah, you got it. Go ahead, Dean. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Excellent. Thank you. What do we say? Objective. Objective. How so? There you go. That's exactly right. See, you guys, this is, yeah. Um, but also, let's see, let's see this. So, the righteous for the unrighteous, right? Yeah. Subjective thinkers, or sorry, yeah, no, subjective thinkers also use this very much to show righteous for unrighteous, a transition, a transformation. So, this is also, you're going to find, First Peter is a huge... Um, there's a lot in First Peter that ends up in subjective. That's just one of the things that you see in the Bible is Peter probably had a more subjective, if we were going to put a box around what Peter thought, it's probably subjective. Put a box around what Paul thought, it was probably classic and objective. You put a box around what John thought, almost exclusively classic, right? We can talk, we'll talk more about that as we get into it, but uh, how many more do I have? Okay, just four, just four. Uh, Mark 10. 45. This one's great. Who's got it? Who's got it? You got it, Lou. Go ahead. For the Son of God, for the Son of Man, came not to be uh, served, but to serve, and to give his life a. I'm sorry for that. You're, You're good. <clears throat> to give his life a uh, reason for many. Ransom for many. Yep. To give his life a ransom for many. Right, so it's classic for the ransom. It's classic for the ransom. Totally right about that. What else do we see? Son of man. Yeah. There's some very human word stuff here, yeah. right? Yeah. Even the naming of it, serve his to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Came not to be served, but to serve. This is used in a lot of subjective thinking as well. So classic. I mean, we talked about how those are fairly well connected, um, and there's an argument to be made that there's not much of a difference, but there is a definitive one. Um, 
but people will use this sometimes to say that the ransom was paid to God. It's actually not convincing if you look at the rest of the passage. So Galatians 3.13. Who's got it? Yes, go ahead. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Mm. Cursed. So yeah, so there's there's definitely I mean this was one of the things about the classic theory is that uh, And this is a much smaller thing Alan might get into it But in the classic theory or in the classic paradigm you find that a ransom paid to evil the devil Satan powers of this world and sometimes the law That the, that the ransom was paid to the law. There's an argument that that actually gets into objective because who gave the law, right? But I think you're totally right in saying that it is um, classic. Uh, it's also, you'll see this used sometimes in subjective stuff. I don't know, Tony, you'll be able to speak more about that, but um, this is uh, becoming a curse for us. This is very human focused kind of stuff. So anyway, two more, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Uh, I will read this one. No, I'll read the last one because it's long. All right, who's For got this? For our sake, yeah. God made the one who knew no sin to be sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We've already done it. Didn't realize I did two of the same. How fun is that? So Colossians 2, 13 through 15. And when you were dead in trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive together with him. When he forgave all our trespasses, erasing the record that stood against us with its legal demands. He set this aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and made a public example of them, triumphing over them. This one's confusing. I'm going to tell you that right off the bat. What do we see? So let's start at the end. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and made a public example of them, triumphing over him. That last bit, where does that fall? The law, uh, having to deal with the law and the authorities, you can put them in the past. Yep. But he's also uh, uh, really just kind of is focused around him, being the disarmer. Mm -hmm. So you can put them objective. Yep. But in the first verse, it's talking about the peoples and how that when and how God changed them. Mm -hmm. So when that ends up, subjective. Yep. This is one of the biggest ones that everybody uses on their side uh, because. It seems, this is probably my favorite explication of atonement in the New Testament. That's why I saved it for last. Because it does all three without giving any of them up, right? We see so clearly we were dead in our trespasses. God is the one that made us alive together. When he forgave us all our trespasses, erasing the record that stood against us. Very objective and subjective. He set this aside, nailing it to the cross. He did the work, objective. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and made a public example of them, rulers and authorities. This is what we see when we take kind of a zoom out of the Bible. It's probably the best example that we have of truly all three paradigms have to work together. And so when we do on the last week, we'll do a debate, but in reality, we'll be showing how they all work together to kind of ah, prove, not prove, but to show how in the scriptures there is no... The scriptures is not going to adhere to our clean little boxes. So, anyway, um, then other concerns, the building of a systematic theology. We already talked about that. Uh, any questions or concerns? Yes. Where is it written, the curse you hang on tree? Is that the Old Testament? That's Leviticus. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Thomas? Um, it's not a uh, question. It's more of an observation. So sure. I, I, I look for patterns, and what I'm trying to find here is, where do these line up? And I'm noticing there is no. <laughs> so how do you, how do you how how do we explain that they wrote in classic objective and subjective across the board? Yeah. Like they They're, they themselves weren't classic objective or subjective. So how right. do we get to pull that? Out? Um, kind of we find the patterns as well. Like in looking through how um, historically they have written. So like. I say that Paul is very kind of classic, and he gets into objective, but what, what do you see here? Paul, who wrote Colossians, mm -hmm. is in all three. Paul, who wrote 
so much of this is in all three. Mm -hmm. I say that first Peter, I say that Peter is very, very much subjective. And I think I put him only there. But the reality is if you read first Peter, you're going to find lots of stuff about the devil. That's very classic, right? Mm -hmm. And so we say this stuff not to, not to try and put them in the boxes, but to try and let ourselves kind of understand in, in clearer ways. So like these are, these are made up boxes. These don't exist, really. Okay. This is just helpful for us to understand. And if you do any reading about the atonement, you're going to find people who are writing in these boxes. Very, very few people are going to try and take all of them and put them together. But this is what we've been working with for at least 500 years since at the very least the reformation likely before but we've seen these three things kind of be what we're talking about with what happened on the cross you have people who think that jesus paid a ransom to the powers of the world you have other people who think that jesus paid a ransom to god you have other people who think that jesus died to show us how to live that's really the big three ideas and there are lots of splinter things but on the on the whole this is what we're talking about does that make sense mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions? I have one more question. Yes. How do you, how, can you be tested on seminary in this, or do you have to just take random papers? Like, how would you? <laughs> how uh, do you provide the evidence for this? How can I provide evidence for this? I read the Bible a lot. I don't know. <laughs> like, can you be tested, like, multiple choice? Pick oh, sure. Paper? Yeah, I mean, you can. Like, there's, it's more, I guess, write a paper is the honest one to, like, make your argument. Okay. Because um, some of them are, like, Oh, this is very, very clear. And some of them are like, like this last one. That's all. To say that, it's, yeah, and like if you're if you're convincing enough, you get the yeah, grade. you like, have to be correct. There might be there 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 was a version of this class that I thought about doing where I would take I would ask the same question and then I would just argue against it. And like I would ask you guys to put say like what do you think it is? And I'd say well what about this? What about this? And try to show it was a different one than the other one to kind of prove that. I didn't have time to put all that together, but. Um, I, but there was a version of that class in my head that, uh, that was that today. So really, really, can I be tested on it? Can you be tested on it? You could be. It'd be a tough one to grade though. <laughs> so, uh, other than that, upcoming classes next week is Tony. Woo! It's Tony. And then we've got Alan and then me and then our debate slash conversation. Make sense? Uh, I will put this up on our... Google Drive page with just some of the stuff that, and I'll write it all out and we'll be good. Thanks, all good? good. Thank you. Cool, cool, cool. See y'all next week.